Good evening, friends. We are going to read Black Boy. This is part seven. We're starting on page 85. And um, I think the only thing I have to say about today beforehand is that, again, you're going to hear a lot of the N-word. And instead of talking about my beliefs about this, because this isn't about me, this is about reading Richard Wright, I want to say that I'm going to honor... Um, yeah, his words, but also use an M instead of an N in front of the word, um, just so I can meet what my um, my goals are for this project, which is to have it be online so anybody can access it at any time that they want to. If I get to saying it exactly how it's written, quite possibly the video might be removed. So that's the reason, y'all. I do have my timer set finally. Um, we're part starting on page 85. When we left last time, um, he was finally in school and he was just really nervous when he was um, called up to the board to to speak and write his name and address. Um, so I'll start here. I was sent to the blackboard to write my name and address. I knew my name and address. I knew how to write it. I knew how to spell it. But standing at the blackboard with eyes, the eyes of the many boys and girls looking at my back made me freeze inside, and I was unable to write a single letter. Write your name, the teacher called to me. I lifted the white chalk to the blackboard, and as I was about to write, my mind just went blank, empty. Oh, gosh, people are texting me. Went blank, empty. I could not remember my... Um, I could not remember... My name. Not even the first letter. Somebody giggled and I stiffened. Just forget us and write your name, honey. An address, the teacher coaxed. An impulse to write would flash through me, but my hand would refuse to move. The children began to twitter, and I flushed hotly. Don't you know your name? The teacher asked. I looked at her and I could not answer. The teacher rose and walked to my side, smiling at me to give me confidence. She placed her hand tenderly on my shoulder. What's your name? Richard, I whispered. Richard what? Richard Wright? Spell it. I spelled my name in a wild rush of letters, trying desperately to redeem my paralyzing shyness. Spell it slowly so I can hear it, she directed me, and I did. Now, can you write? Yes, ma'am. Then write it. Again, I turned to the blackboard and lifted my hand to write. Then I was blank and I was void and within. I tried frantically to collect my senses, but I could not remember nothing. A sense of the girls and boys behind me filled me with the exclusion of everything. I realized how utterly I was failing and I grew weak and leaned on my, my, and leaned my hot forehead on the cool blackboard. The room burst into a loud, prolonged laugh and my muscles froze. You may go to your seat, the teacher said. I sat and cursed myself. Why did I appear so, why did I always appear so dumb when I was called upon to perform something in, in front of a crowd? So it's interesting, as I read this, I think about, like as a, as a teacher, I think about, um, like things today that would be called a learning disability, right? That you might get support with. Um, and so anyway, it just wasn't a, it probably wasn't a thing then. And uh, and maybe it wasn't a disability at all. Maybe it was just what it was with, with nothing to call it except for him being shy in front of a crowd. I knew how to write as well as any pupil in the classroom. I had no doubt. I could read better than any of them, and I could talk fluently and expressively when I was sure of myself. Then why did strange faces make me freeze? I sat with my ears and neck burning, hearing the pupils whisper about me, hating myself, hating them. I sat still as stone, and a storm of emotion surged through me. While sitting in class one day, I was startled to hear the, whisper, the whistles and blowing and ringing of bells. Soon the bedlam was deafening and the teacher lost control of her class and the girls and the boys ran to the window. The teacher left the room and when she returned, she announced, everybody pack your things and go home. 
Why? What happened? The war is over, the teacher said. I followed the rest of the children into the street and I saw that white and black people were laughing and singing and shouting. I felt afraid as I pushed through the crowds of white people, but my fright left when I entered my neighborhood and saw smiling black faces. I wandered among them, trying to realize what war was, what it meant, and I could not. I noticed that many girls and boys were pointing at something in the sky. I looked up too and saw what seemed to be a tiny bird wheeling and sailing. Look, a plane! I had never seen a plane. It's a bird, I said. The crowd laughed. That's a plane, boy, a man said. It's a bird, I said. I see it. A man lifted me upon his shoulders. Boy, remember this, he said. You are seeing man fly. I still did not believe it. I still looked up and saw what a bird was to me. That night at home, my mother convinced me that men could fly. Christmas came and I had but one orange. I was hurt. And I would not go out to play with the neighborhood children who were blowing horns and shooting firecrackers. I nursed my orange all of Christmas Day. At night, just before going to bed, I ate it. First taking a bite out of the top and sucking the juice as I squeezed it. Finally, I tore the peeling into bits and I munched them slowly. Chapter 3 Having grown taller and older, I now associated with older boys and I had to pay for my admittance to their company by subscribing to certain racial sentiments. The touchstone of fraternity was my feeling toward white people, how much hostility I held toward them, what degree of value and honor I assigned to race. None of this was premeditated, but sprang spontaneously out of the talk of black boys who met at the crossroads. I was it was degrading to play with girls, and in our talk, we regulated them to a remote island of life. We had somehow caught the spirit of the role of our sex, and we flocked together for communion and moral schooling. We spoke boastfully in bass voices. We used the word nigger to prove the tough fiber of our feelings. We sprouted excessive profanity and a sign of our coming. It was a sign of our coming manhood. We pretended callousness toward the injunctions of our parents, and we strove to convince one another that our decisions stemmed from ourselves and ourselves alone. Yet, we frantically concealed how dependent we were on, upon one another. Of an afternoon when school had let out, I would saunter down the street, idly kicking empty tin cans or knocking a stick against the palings of a wooden fence or whistling until I would stumble upon one or more of the gang loitering at a corner, standing in the field or sitting upon the steps of somebody's house. Hey, I said timidly, you eat yet? Uneasily trying to make conversation. Yeah, man, I done really fed my face, casually. I had cabbage and potatoes, confidently. I had buttermilk and black eyed peas, meekly informational. Hell, I ain't gonna stand near you, nigga. Pronouncement. How come? Fiend innocence. Cause you gonna smell up this air in a minute? A shouted accusation. Laughter runs through the crowd. Nigga, your mind is in a ditch. Amusingly moralistic. Ditch nothing, nigga. You gonna break wind any minute now. Triumphant pronouncement, creating suspense. Yeah. When them black eyed peas tell that buttermilk to move over, that buttermilk ain't going to want to move over and there's going to be a war in your guts and your stomach going to swell up and bust. Climax. The crowd laughs loud and hard. Man, them white folks ought to catch you and send you to the zoo and keep you for the next war, throwing the subject into a wider field. Then... When that fighting starts, they ought to feed you on buttermilk and black-eyed peas and let you break wind. The subject is accepted and extended. You win the war with a new kind of poison gas, a shouted climax. There is high laughter that simmers down slowly. Maybe poison gas is something you, it's you, maybe poison gas is something good to have. The subject of white folks is associ associationally swift 
swept into an obert of them. Okay, I'm starting that one over. Maybe poison gas is something good to have. The subject of white folks is associationally swept into the orbit of talk. Yeah, if they have a race ride around here, I'm going to kill all them white folks with my poison. Bitter pride. Gleeful laughter, then silence, each waiting for the other to contribute something to the conversation. Them white folks show scared of us, though. Sober statement of an old problem. Yeah, they send you to war, make you lick them Germans, teach you how to fight. Then you come back and they scared of you, want to kill you. Half boastful and half complaining. My mama says that old white women, where she works, talking about slapping her. And my mom said, Miss Green, if you slaps me, I kill you and go to hell to pay for it. Extension, developmental sacrificial boasting. Hell, I would have just killed her if she'd have had said that to me. An angry grunt of supreme racial assertion. Silence. Man, them white folks sure is mean. Complaining. That's how come colored folks leaving the South. Informational. And man, they sure hate you for leaving. Pride of personal and racial worth implied. Yeah, they want to keep you here and work you to death. The first white son of a bitch that calls me, that bothers me and calls me a nigga, is going to get a hole knocked in his head. That ain't going to do you no good. Hell, they catch you. <laughs> yeah, goddamn it. They really catch you now. Yeah, white folks sit on their white asses all day and night. But let a nigga do something. And they get every bloodhound that was ever born and put him on his trail. Man, you reckon these white folks is ever going to change? Timid questioning hope. Hell no. Nah. They just born that way. Rejecting hope for fear. That could never come true. Shucks, man. I'm going north when I get grown. A colored man's all right up north. They say a white man hit a colored man up north. And that colored man hit that white man back. Knocked him cold, and nobody did a damn thing. Man, man for man up there. Listen, you reckon them buildings up north is as tall as they say they is? They say they got a building up north in New York, 40 stories high. A thing too incredible for belief. Man, I'd be scared of them buildings. You know. They say that them buildings sway and rock in the wind. No, nigga. Yeah, they do. You reckon that could be? Hell no. Nah. If a building swayed and rocked in the wind, he'd fall. Any fool knows that. Don't let people make a fool out of you telling you them things. Silence. Somebody would pick up a stone and toss it across a field. Man, what makes white folks so mean? returning to grapple with an old problem. Whenever I see one, I spit. Man, <laughs> ain't they ugly? Man, you ever get close to a white man, close enough to smell him? They say we, they say we stink, but my ma says white folks smell like dead folks. Niggas smell from sweat, but white folks smell all the time. And the talk would weave and roll and surge and spurt and view and, and veer and swell, having no specific aim or direction, touching vast areas of life, expressing the tentative impulses of childhood, money, God, race, sex, color, war, planes, machines, trains, swimming, boxing, anything. The culture of one black household was, was thus transmitted to another black household, and folks' tra traditions were handed from group to group. Our attitudes were made, defined, set, or corrected, or our ideas were discovered, discarded, enlarged, torn apart, and accepted. It, it's just interesting as I read this. It just, to me, he illustrated nicely how, um, how kids influence one another, and that influence comes from home. And so... I feel like they're building one another up. They're influencing one another. They're exchanging ideas and uh, kind of acting out in their youth.
what they see in their with the adults in life. So I'll keep reading. Night would fall. Bats would zip through the air. Crickets would cry from the grass. Frogs would croak. The stars would come out. Dew would dampen the earth. Yellow squares of light would grow in the distance as kerosene lamps were lit in homes. Finally, from across the fields or down the road, a long, slow yell would come. You, David! Easy laughter among the boys, but no reply. Calling the hogs. You better go on home, pig. Laughter again. A boy would slowly detach himself from the gang. You, Debbie! He would not answer his mother's call, for that would have been a sign of dependence. I'll do y'all like the farmer did the potato, the boy would say. Mm-hmm, how's that? Plant you now and dig you later. The boy would trot home slowly, and there would be more easy laughter, more talk. One by one, we would be called home to fetch water from the hydrant in the backyard. Or go to the store and buy some greens and meal for tomorrow. Or split the, word for the, split the wood for the kindling. On Sundays, if our clothes were presentable, my mother would take me and my brother to Sunday school. We did not object, for church was not where we learned of God or his ways, but where we met our school friends and continued our long, rambling talks. Some of the Bible stories were interested were interesting in themselves, but we always twisted them, secularized them to the level of our street life, rejecting all meanings that did not fit into our environment. And we did the same to the beautiful hymns when the preacher intoned, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We would wink at each other and hum under our breath. The bulldog ran my grandma down. <laughs> we were now large enough for the white boys to fear us, and both of us, the white boys and the black boys, began to play our traditional racial roles as though we had been born to them, as though it was in our blood, as though we were being guided by instinct. All the frightful descriptions we had heard heard about each other, all the violent expressions of hate and hostility that had seeped into us from our surroundings came now to the surface to guide our actions. The roundhouse was the radical boundary of the neighborhood, and it had been tactically agreed between the white boys and the black boys that the whites were to keep to the far side of the roundhouse and we blacks would keep to our side. Whenever we caught a white boy on our side, we stoned him. If they strayed to their, if we strayed to their side, they stoned us. So this has a connection in my family because when my mother, my grandmother was 27, she had seven kids, her and um, my grandfather, and um, a rock fight broke out in the Yesler Terrace where they lived between the white boys and the black boys. And as a result of that rock fight, the two fathers got into it and the white man killed my grandfather. So my mother was six. And there were seven of them and they all saw the whole transaction. They saw the rock fight. They saw the killing of their father. And, um, and then my grandmother was widowed at 27 with seven kids. Worked three jobs. Bought a home in the CD. Raised her children. We won't go down that road. But anyway, there's a connection for me. Um, and, and the rest of their lives and all their children, our lives were all touched by race. Um, and rock fights our battles were real and bloody we threw rocks and cinders and coal and sticks and pieces of iron and broken bottles and whilst we threw them we longed for even deadlier weapons we were hurt we took it quietly there was no crying or whimpering if if our wounds were not truly serious we hid them from our parents we did not want to be beaten for fighting once in a battle with a gang of white boys, I was struck behind the ear with a piece of broken bottle. The cut was deep and bled profusely. I tried to stem the flood of blow by dabbing the cut with a rag. And when my mother came from work, I was forced to tell her that I was hurt for I needed medical attention. She rushed me to the doctor who stitched up my scalp. But when she took me home, she beat me. Telling me that I must never fight white boys again. 
that I might be killed by them, that she had to work and ain't had, had no time to worry about my fights. Her words did not sink in, for they conflicted with the code of the streets. I promised my mother that I would not fight again, but I knew if I kept my word, I would lose my standing in the gang, and the gang's life was my life. Now, there's this idea that we have of gangs, right? He's like 10 right here. And so if you've been listening from the beginning, you can think about everything that's happened in his life so far and why he might benefit and need a group of boys who are going through similar things, who are his friends. Um, and it's being called a gang, but for anyone who's ever misunderstood um, kind of gangs and how they form and have an idea of, of what that's about, it's not about uh, drug dealing, right? Okay. My mother became too ill to work, and I began to do chores in the neighborhood. My first job was carrying lunches to the men who worked in the roundhouse, for which I received 25 cents a week. When the men did not finish their lunches, I would salvage what few crumbs remained. Later, I obtained a job in a small cafe carting wood in my arms to keep the big stove going and taking trays of food to passengers when trains stopped for a half hour or so in the nearby station. I received a dollar a week for this work. Excuse me. I don't know. Why do I? I don't know. But I was too young and too small to perform the duties. One morning, while trying to take a heavily loaded tray up the steps of the train, I fell and dashed the tray of food to the ground. Inability to pay rent for us forced us to move into a house perched atop high logs in a section of the town where floodwaters came. My brother and I had run, had um, great fun running up and down the tall, shaky steps. Again, paying rent became a problem, and we moved near to the center of town, where I found a job in a pressing shop, delivering clothes to hotels, sweeping floors, and listening to Negro men boast about their sex lives. Yet again, we moved, this time to the outskirts of town, near a wide stretch of railroad tracks, which each morning before school, I would take a sack to gather coal to heat our framed house, a framed house, dodging in and out between the huge black puffing engines to get coal. My mother, her health failing rapidly, spoke constantly now of Granny's home, how ardently she wanted to see us grow up before she died. Already there, Oh, already there had crept into her speech a halting, lisping quality. Though I did not know it, it was the shadow of her future. I was more conscious of my mother now, completely without her, and what com what being completely without her would mean to me. I slowly had a rising dread, and it stole into me, and I would look at my mother for long moments. But when she looked at me, I would look away. Then real fear came as her illness reoccurred at shorter intervals. Time stood still. My brother and I waited, hungry and afraid. So you are catching that, like his mother can't work. And so he's going around collecting coal and doing odd jobs in order to like feed them and different things. He's probably about 10 right now. One morning, a shouting voice awakened me. Richard, Richard. I rolled out of bed. My brother came running into the room. Richard, you better come and see mama. She's very sick. I ran into my mother's room and saw her lying upon her bed, dressed, her eyes open, and her mouth gaped. She was very ill. Mama, I called, but she did not answer or turn her head. I reached forward to shake her, but drew back, afraid that she was dead. Mama, I called again, my mind unable to grasp that she could not answer. Finally, I went to her and shook her. She moved slightly and she groaned. My brother and I called her repeatedly, Mama, Mama, but she did not speak. Was she dying? It was simply unthinkable. My brother and I looked at each other. We did not know what to do. We better get somebody, I said. I ran into the hallway and called a neighbor. A tall black woman bustled out of her door. Please, won't you come and see my mama? She won't talk. We can't wake her up. She's terribly sick, I told her. She followed me into our flat. Mrs. Wright, she called to my mother. My mother lay still, unseen and silent. The woman felt my mother's hands. Oh, she ain't dead, but she's sick all right. I better get some more of the neighbors. Five or six women came, into, came and my brother and I waited in the hallway while they undressed my mother, put her to bed. When we were allowed back in the room, a woman said, 
Looks like she had a stroke to me. Look like paralysis to me. Mm, and she's so young, someone else said. My brother and I stood against the wall while the bustling women worked frantically over my mother. A stroke? Paralysis? What were these things? Would she die? One of the women asked me if there were, was any money in the house, and I did not know. They searched through dresser drawers and found one or two dollar bills and sent for a doctor. The doctor arrived. Yes, he told us. My mother had suffered a stroke of paralysis. She was in a serious condition. She needed someone with her day and night. She needed medicine. Where was her husband? I told them the story. I told him the story and he just shook his head. She'll need help. She'll need all the help she can get, the doctor said. Her entire left side is paralyzed. She can't talk. She'll have to be fed. Later that day, I rummaged through drawers and found Granny's address. I wrote to her, pleading with her to come help us. The neighbors nursed my mother day and night, fed us and washed our clothes. I went through the days with a stunned consciousness, unable to believe what had happened. Okay, so that um, was our 25 minutes. Um, yeah, if you've been listening from the beginning, just kind of, I'm thinking about a few things. I'm thinking about how they ended up in Memphis, which isn't all the way north, but it's north of where they were in Jackson, right? Um, all the circumstances of why they left and why they are where they are. Like everything compounded is is a part of how they how they are right now, right? Like they were safe when they went to see their um their Aunt Maggie, but Aunt Maggie was um they were affluent, right? But then the white folks killed Aunt Maggie's husband and took because he had a successful uh, saloon, right? So then they ended up back home and then they're back there again. And uh, Aunt Maggie was with her and then Aunt Maggie left with the new husband. And so anyway, um, yeah, thank you for hearing. We stopped on page 97. So I will write that in the notes. We stopped on page 97. Thanks for joining. Peace.